And thank you to all of you for joining us. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending where you are. I'm going to share my screen so you should be able to see my slides now. But let's do a quick check. Can you type in the chat yes and yes to confirm that you can see me and you can hear me? Excellent, great, great start. So let's begin. So we're going to talk about developing listening skills in this webinar and particularly focusing on these new teacher guides, uh, which can be used as a training and a teaching tool. So we designed them with attention to teaching and learning first and foremost in an assessment context. And they include insights into listening, the skill and the subskills. But primarily it's about pedagogy. It's about good teaching, good learning with an exam focus. So if you're teaching learners to prepare them for an exam, then these guides are for you. The activities are very practical. They're intended for teaching and the audio is integrated. So you'll see an example of that later that you can find the clips inside the activities. There's also a teacher resource pack um, and that again, we'll see in a moment and that's linked to the activities in the guide. So let's just be super clear before we continue, the levels that we're talking about are these higher levels of the CEFR. So we're talking about these ones right at the top, the learners with the highest, most advanced level of English. So B2, sometimes called upper intermediate, C1, sometimes called advanced, and then everything after that. So these are the activities that we're going to look at in this webinar. And if you're interested in the lower levels, there was another webinar recently with Miranda Hamilton about the lower level guides. So these guides exist for five different levels of the Cambridge exams. And if you're interested in the lower levels, I recommend you check out Miranda's recent webinar. There's a recording on YouTube. So let's continue and let's talk about the high level learners, B2, C1, C2. And welcome to the guides. This is what they look like. The B2 one is this purple one on the left, and then there's C1 and C2, and they all follow a structure and a format, so they're quite familiar. And I know a lot of us teach classes at different levels. So once you know the structure of one guide, you know the structure of them all. And as I mentioned, there are links to resource packs in the guide. So we want the guides to be easy to use. You know, we're all busy. We've got lots of lessons to teach, lots of things to plan. So rather than give you hundreds of pages, we've kept the guides short and any of the resources you need, you can download by a link from the guide. This is what the resource pack looks like. And inside it, you'll find the tasks that you'll need to use for the activities. For example, you'll find answer keys, you'll find scripts. So all of the things that you need to do the activities effectively, they're in the guide. And the reason that we've developed these, particularly in the past sort of year, year and a half, is that often face-to-face -face professional development isn't an easy option. A lot of us are teaching remotely. Our professional development options have changed somewhat, and we're really learning as we go. So we've made guides to help us train ourselves and to reflect and try new things when we can't attend face-to-face -face sessions. So the guides are intended to support you to support learners in this context. And we do that by making links between listening as a language skill and the pedagogy of listening. So how to teach it, how to learn it effectively with a focus on what that looks like in an exam context. The idea being that we're preparing learners to be successful in their final exam. So there are tips and activities throughout every guide with a focus on how the exam is structured but delivered in a way that develops the skill of listening in general. So if you're wondering now, great, where can I find them? I'm going to show you a little bit later in the webinar. So be patient first, let's explore the guides, find out what's in them and how they can help you support your learners. So I mentioned that 
primarily the guides are about the skill of listening. And in the guides, you'll find that there are insights into how the skill, <clears throat> excuse me, how the skill of listening can be broken into sub skills. So let's look at one of those now. We're gonna talk about prediction as a sub skill of listening. So I want you to choose between these two options. What do you think? And a poll is going to appear on your screen. Do you think all learners need practice in the sub skill of prediction? Or it's quite helpful for low level learners, but higher level learners, so B2, upper intermediate and up, probably don't need to practice. So a poll has appeared on your screen. Please vote now. And if you have any comments, add them in the chat box. Oh, wow, you are super fast. So 300 people voting and more and more and most of you choosing option A. Any comments in the chat box? Okay, so some people choosing option A in the chat, whatever the level. Absolutely, absolutely. If you chose option A, I agree with you. So all learners need to practice prediction because of course the things we're listening to and the amounts that we understand are different at different levels. Thank you so much to everyone who voted. Let's look at an example together. So the guide encourages practicing prediction skills. And again, it's not just about saying do this, but it's about how to do this. So the guide is full of activities. We're going to do an example together now. So the activity is often begin with a prepare to listen, prepare to understand section. And this includes things like, for example, highlighting keywords, discussing the questions and the topic, anticipating vocabulary. All of these things are about getting learners ready for what they're going to hear in a natural way, because usually we have some idea of what's coming before we hear something. And it's about practice. So again, the guides are designed with activities to help you practice. And with this practice, learners will know on exam day, what to look for in the questions. And if you practice enough in advance, that process will become automatic. So they'll be able to do it quickly in the exam. And that's really important. So they use their time well. So we're going to do an example of this. Uh, I've taken the example from the C1 advanced guide, but prediction is practiced in all of the guides. So this is just an example. The example we're using comes from part two of the listening paper, and we're making a connection to another skill and another part of the exam, because of course, listening doesn't happen by itself, it's connected to all skills. And in the exam, the learners need to integrate skills. So this is what we're going to do in our example. Are you ready? We're taking this example. So here's a part two task where the learners will hear a scientist called Daniel Chan talking about his work on natural remedies. So what we do is we take this topic and we exploit it and we explore it before they listen. And the link we're making here in this activity is to the speaking paper. And in this part of the speaking paper, you probably know, the learners have to compare pictures. So the interlocutor says to them, I'm going to give each of you three pictures. I'd like you to talk about two of them on your own for about a minute, and also to answer a question briefly about your partner's pictures. So the activity in the guide is based around this idea of doing a little bit of discussion before listening on the topic. So here's our, our practice discussion. I've picked some pictures. I know already because I, as the teacher, I've listened to the recording, I've read the audio script, and I know that the person mentions soup, hot chocolate, and honey. So I go online, I find some pictures of these things, and I use these to put the students in pairs and get them to practice discussing these in the style of a speaking practice. So it looks a little bit like this. The students have the pictures. And as the examiner, I say these pictures show three different foods that some people enjoy when they're feeling ill. I'd like you to compare two of the pictures 
and say why you think people choose to eat these things when they're ill and how useful they are for fighting a common cold. So a very typical style of speaking to prompt and it's related to the topic of the listening. So helping develop predictive skills. Student A speaks for a minute. And then I invite student B, which of these foods would you prefer if you were ill and why? So if you're familiar with the C1 advanced exam, you'll recognize this as fairly typical of that kind of task. But the students aren't at this point thinking about their speaking exam. They're not even thinking about the listening exam. They're just having a conversation about an interesting topic. So they're developing their speaking skills and they're also effectively predicting the content of the listening because in a moment, they're going to hear this scientist talking about exactly this topic, about natural remedies. Okay, so there's our first example, and we'll have other examples through the guide as well, uh, through the webinar, excuse me, other examples from the guide through the webinar. So the guides take each subskill of listening, they give a definition, they give an example from everyday life of how this subskill is used in the real world outside the classroom. And then they make the link to the exam. So they'll show you which part of the exam tests which subskill. Before I show you what that looks like in the guide, let's have in the chat box, can you share what are the different subskills of listening? So in your experience or your opinion or your training, how do we divide listening into subskills? We've mentioned prediction. What are some of the others? Okay, we've got gist and detail. Reading for gist. Yes, so there is often a similarity between the listening subskills and the reading. Listening for opinions. Global understanding, specific information. Mm -hmm, exactly, good, good listening for the main ideas. Okay, great. So the guides explore these ideas that you've mentioned. This is just a small extract from the guide. So you'll see how uh, the guide is structured. We've mentioned predicting. Some of you mentioned listening for gist. There's also specific information. There's detail. Oh, excuse me. Um, so in a moment, we'll see how the guide uh, spells out what's in the exam and how these are related. So again, this is all designed to help you teach the skill of listening. It's not only about the exam, it's also about listening in general. So these subskills are really important. And of course, they are tested in the exam. Okay, let's talk about learner and teacher perspectives on teaching listening skills. So I'm going to ask for your opinions again here. Here comes your question. So the guide explores the challenges of listening from both perspectives and the activities are designed to address those challenges. So I want to ask you, what challenges do learners face? So for the moment, put yourselves in the shoes of a learner. Think in general, and think also, especially at very advanced levels. So what challenges do learners face in listening skills? Can you type your ideas into the chat box? I will read a few out. They're coming very quickly. Getting lost in the information given. Yes, I know that feeling myself as a second language learner. Uh, first time listening, the pace can be a little bit quick. Yes. Um, the accent of the speaker. Yes, if we're not familiar with the speaker's accent, it's likely we'll find it more difficult to understand. Um, nervousness, that's a good point. So it's not just about who is speaking, it's about the person listening and if they feel nervous and their abilities may be affected. Oh, so many great ideas. Oh my goodness, oh, you type so quickly. Uh, not self-confident, yes, exactly. Speed, yes, slang, exactly. So awareness of vocabulary can impact our ability to listen effectively if we just don't recognize the words or we've never heard them before. Um, the time limit, yes. So not just in sort of listening in general, but in the exam, having to listen within a time limit, absolutely. Pronunciation, yes, not recognizing the short form of words when heard. Um, and concentration, yes, absolutely. So it's not just about the sound. Sometimes it's just about the learner's ability to concentrate or pay attention. 
Okay, thank you so much. You've got fantastic ideas here. Let's look at some other ideas. Here's the summary that I've prepared. So you've mentioned a lot of these, uh, too fast. And also, and I apologize if somebody mentioned this, I didn't see it, but other environmental factors like too much noise in the background or not being able to see the speaker's face. So in the exam, of course, we don't use video. It's only listening. It's only the, the sound stream that the learners get to, to get to, um, to access. They don't have access to the speaker's face, their facial expressions and so on. Some of you mentioned some of these as well. So self-belief, motivation. Um, and again, just the topic, not being familiar with the topic uh, or having a language level that's below what's required for the exam they're taking. So some of you mentioned vocabulary, for example, or slang. If the learners don't know the words, they don't recognize them when they hear them. And again, pronunciation, and there are many aspects to this, um, but particularly interesting, I think, is that if you're not familiar with the speaker's voice or their accent, that can make it difficult to understand. If you are familiar, you're more likely to understand speakers from that background. And yes, some of you also saying environmental distractions. Yes, absolutely. Funny you should mention that my dog is here trying to distract me from the webinar right now. So I have a lot of sympathy with these learners. Okay, so we've talked a lot about learners. Um, what about teachers? Now, these ones I'm sure are going to be familiar to you. And these are also challenges that we've tried to address in the guide. So time and space in the syllabus. You know, how much time do you have to teach listening skills? We have so many things to cover and it can be difficult to do listening, especially if we're trying to think of creative activities to make listening engaging. Having access to materials and to audio that is suitable for the exam. So we often find extra materials or things that are really interesting to our, our classes, to, to the learners that we know, but it's difficult to know if those clips and if the activities we're using are appropriate for what the learners are going to face in their exam. So again, from a practical perspective, the guides are designed to achieve uh, a realistic representation of what's coming in their exam. So we know that we're using creative activities and giving them good practice. It's also quite tricky sometimes to do feedback on listening and to check understanding and to really discuss the answers so that learners understand and agree, not just why one answer is right, but why the others are wrong and understanding how the scripts include distractors and how it's easy to get the wrong idea. So the guides have been designed to help you with feedback, not just to conduct the activity, but to follow the activity with really useful feedback. So you can check that learners have really understood. And this is the point, it's about developing their skills, not simply taking lots of practice tests, not simply doing uh, timed activities again and again, but really developing the skill. So when it's time to practice the exam or in the real exam, the learners are well prepared. And of course, technology, that classic uh, challenge for teachers and for learners. And I think in the past year, we found that now it's not only a question of the teacher's technology. You know, have I got the CD? Do I have a CD player? Oh, the speakers aren't working. But it's also a question of the learner's technology, because of course, if we're studying online, we don't have control over everybody's environment, everybody's equipment. Do they have headphones if they're working in a, in a shared space, for example? So all of these things can pose challenges and all of these things have influenced the way we wrote the activities and the way the support is provided to help you use them in practice. Okay, I'm going to show you um, a couple more design features and supports and we're gonna do some more examples. So you can see how this works in practice. So I mentioned um, that the guides have uh, links, at least I think I mentioned, they, they not only have syllabus links, but they have hyperlinks, they have technological links. So here, for example, you'll see an, ex <clears throat> an example of how it looks in the guide when there's a resource that you need, there's a link to the resources PDF. So you don't have to always have all the documents open. When you need it, there's a link and you can go straight to it. And you can also navigate on your screen back and forth through the guide and to different sections of the guide, because we're assuming that a lot of us are working on screens at the moment, you're probably going to be using this guide on a screen. So you need easy access, easy navigation. Here's an example of how that looks. 
So there's an activity and a purple box. The idea is to take the pain out of searching for things and take you directly to the resources. Um, somebody in the chat box is asking, is it free? Yes, absolutely. All of these guides are freely available on the Cambridge English website. And I'll show you where to find them at the end of the webinar. So here, for example, you can see task and recording are underlined. These are links. So when you're reading the activity and you're preparing, you can go directly to the task, directly to the recording without having to search through lots of stuff. So they've been designed to be easy to navigate. And they've also been designed to draw your attention to their different features. So the activities are in a purple box uh, or I think an orange box in the higher level, but they have their own color scheme. So that is your activity. Those are your instructions. Just read that and follow the steps. And then there are also adaptations and they're in a separate box with a separate color. So if you just want to follow the steps, you can ignore the adaptation, but there are also adaptation ideas. If you want to try something different or if your class needs a different challenge, there are also exam strategy boxes. So these explain the strategies which are practiced in the activities, and they also give extra tips to help your learners when they feel confident with listening, but maybe not so confident with the exam, there are tips here in the strategy boxes. And finally, there are also extra boxes with optional follow-ups. So when you've done the listening, what next? How can you connect it to a different part of the exam? Or how can you extend it so learners develop another skill? So there are optional follow-up boxes with the activities as well. And again, these are in all the levels of the guides, not just the high levels. This is what I was referring to earlier about how the exam is laid out. So there is still a teacher handbook for the exams, which gives you lots of detailed information, but there's also a summary in the guide. So you don't need to always be referring to different documents. And as a teacher, I often find these things helpful for the learners too. So I can easily share with them how the exam is structured in plain English that's graded to a level that they'll understand. So you can see here that each exam part is identified. Uh, this example comes from B2 first for schools, but this is in all the guides. It also tells you the format of each part of the exam and what the learner has to do in that task. So for example, they listen to a monologue or they listen to an interview, et cetera. And in terms of skills, what are the listening skills being tested? So again, if you're talking to your learners about practicing listening for specific information, and I know I have students sometimes who say, yeah, yeah, I know it's important, but I want to practice the exam. Well, this is a way of showing to them that that skills development is very relevant for their exam. And this helps you connect the different sub skills with the parts of the exam that test those skills. So it's about helping learners understand how to learn and how to approach the exam. And there are also some top tips. So every activity has tips specific to that activity. Um, here's one, for example, which talks about the, the intention to develop listening skills and not test them, which again, I know a lot of students, especially if they feel nervous, can say, okay, I, but you know, this is all, this is too much fun. I want to practice the exam, you know, it's, I want to do the serious part. So we've included tips throughout to explain and to, to, um, to make it clear why developing skills is part of good exam prep. And in this activity, that's the focus, is getting better at listening, not simply practice, 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 but developing and understanding the skill and reflecting on your strengths and weaknesses. So every activity has tips. And the guide, ah, excuse me, here's another example uh, of a higher level, I should mention. So from the C2 proficiency exam at the top of the, of the levels of difficulty, um, another tip here mentions how the range of topics can be very wide. Um, and the rest of the tip gives examples of how you can help learners prepare for such a wide possible range of topics in their exam. Now, I'd like to ask uh, for your suggestions as well, but I'll just quickly address a question in the chat. Somebody asks, how can the activities be sent online to students? Are they PDF? 
So the resources guide is a PDF and it contains all of the activities. And it contains both the blank clean activity for use by students. And it also includes annotated scripts, answer keys and things for the teacher. I hope that answers your question. So let's look at some do's and don'ts. So not only does the guide have top tips per activity, but it also have tips for, it has tips for the different stages of a listening lesson or for different aspects of listening, different sub skills. So it has general advice, but it also has tips for what to do before you listen, while you listen and after you listen. Now there are loads of tips in the guide and I could talk for days about them, but I'd like to hear your opinions. So please use the chat box. We're going to have a little teacher tips exchange. Can you please type any of your top tips into the chat for listening? All of your ideas are welcome. So any of these areas before, while, or after listening, what are your top tips from your experience? Hey, we've got, oh, oh goodness, oh, they're coming so fast. Okay, I will try to keep up. Brainstorm ideas, look for clues in the questions. Yeah, try to predict before, yes. Uh, 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 games. Uh, ah, somebody asks, will the recording of this webinar be available later? Yes, it will. Now, back to your teacher top tips exchange. Uh, explaining core vocab, yes, so keywords before they listen, absolutely. Practice, practice, practice. I agree, practice makes perfect. Uh, be relaxed, that is a very good top tip. That never hurts, I think, just in life in general, not just listening skills. And first making them comfortable, absolutely. It's really nice to see so many examples from you of top tips which kind of refer to the, the learner as a, as a whole person, as well as a listener in an exam. Brainstorming possible answers. Yes, absolutely. So sometimes it's great to just give the question with no multiple choice and see what the learners expect or what they imagine before they get to see options. Uh -huh, okay, paying attention to stressed parts of speech. Yes, absolutely. So working on pronunciation is not just about speaking. It's also about listening and what we hear. Uh, listen carefully to the instructions. Yes, absolutely agreed to make sure that they don't make silly mistakes because they misunderstood the task. Always listen to the instructions. Gap fill the audio script. That's interesting. There are some activities that are similar in design in the guides. Uh, read the whole question. Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. You have so many great suggestions here and I wish I had time to read them all. Let's move on to the next part. So we have another poll. A poll is going to arrive on your screen in just a moment with these two questions. So these are about after listening. And I want to know your opinion. What do you think is more appropriate for feedback after listening? So option A, confirm the correct answers after listening and ask a strong student to explain why it's correct. Or option B, wait until the learners have discussed and explained their answers before you confirm which is correct. So there's a poll on your screen. Please try to answer in the poll. It helps to see the, the split of opinion. Great, so we've got, oh, a few hundred of you have voted already, excellent. Most people choosing option B, a few people choosing option A. Okay, some people in the chat also choosing B, second one, okay. Okay, about half of you have voted now. Most people choosing B, some people choosing A. Someone says important, B if there is time. Okay, that's an interesting comment. I will come back to that. Okay, thank you. Speaking of time, thank you. I think we'll stop there and continue. So let me show you my own opinion would agree with yours is the second one is waiting until learners have discussed and explained before confirming which is correct. And as some of you have said in the chat box, if there is time. Now, my personal opinion is that this is some of the most valuable time we have in the lesson. And if I had to extend the time for any stage in my listening lesson, it would be the feedback. Because this is where the real learning happens is where we think about what we just did. If it was effective, why was it effective? 
uh, as one of you mentions in the chat, it's not just right or wrong, but why? So this is really where the rich learning happens is in feedback. And I absolutely understand time is limited. So if I can borrow time from any other part of the lesson and dedicate it to feedback, I'll usually do that. And here's an example of how that appears in the guide. So the top tips are really about professional development and developing skills. We don't just say choose option B, but we say why. So for example, here, the tip explains that by simply accepting the first answer that somebody offers, or by getting a strong student to explain, then we run the risk that the strongest learner pushes the pace of the whole class. And that's how we end up with very mixed abilities in our class is because we're moving at the pace of one or two learners and not including everybody. And we're also not giving those strong learners the opportunity to demonstrate their learning and to support their peers at the same time as we're not giving their peers the chance to catch up. So yes, it's tricky to find enough time, but I would say this is so valuable and time well spent. So this is how the guide works. We give you top tips, we say why, we give some suggestions, and then we also link to the activities. So for example, if the guide says you should practice strategies to check the question, like highlighting or analyzing the question, then there is a link, a hyperlink to activity one. So you can say, ah, yes, I need to do that. Which activity will practice that? And it's there and you can click on it and it goes straight to the activity. This example comes from the C1 guide, but there are links like this in all of the levels of guide. Similarly, if the guide says, make time, use your feedback time to discuss distractors. So what is in the script that can be distracting and lead learners to the wrong answer? Then again, there's a link to the activities that help you do this. So discussing why one option is correct, why the other options are wrong, that happens in these activities. Click, go, have a look. And the guide also has in the resource pack answer keys and audio scripts that are annotated. And when I'm teaching high levels, I find this really helpful because at the very high levels, sometimes the differences in meaning and the explanations of a question or a correct answer to a question are so tricky. There's so much nuance that it really helps to have a clear step-by-step -step explanation of why this answer is right and why this one is wrong and to feel that you have that support. I'm sure we all plan our lessons. I'm sure we all read things before the lesson, but sometimes something happens in the lesson and you just think, oh gosh, I, I'm not sure. So these have been designed really to help you get to that specific meaning because at high levels that can be particularly tricky. Um, this example comes from the C2 proficiency guide. So this is in the guide. This is part of the activity. It says give learners a copy of the audio script and get them to annotate the script get them to indicate which words have the right answer, which words are potentially distracting. And then in the answer key for the teacher, there's all this explanation. So there's not just the correct answer, but there's also an annotated script with notes explaining why, and also anticipating some of the things that learners might find challenging about that task. So here's an example where the, the script is annotated. So certain key parts are highlighted and the teacher is um, um, supported in identifying distractors. Somebody in the chat asks, you know, is it good to give them the audio script or is this a good way? The activities have actually been designed to indicate when it would be helpful to have a script and at what point to give it. Because again, the purpose is to develop listening skills, not only to test. Um, someone else asks in the chat, is this before or after listening? Well, it depends on the activity. And that's how the activities are designed. So the step-by-step -step approach indicates when is a good time to give a script, if it's a good time to give a script. What should you do with it? How can it be helpful? So every activity is different. Now, I mentioned that fundamentally our purpose is good pedagogy, good teaching, good learning with an exam focus. So we're, we are teaching learners in preparation for an exam. So we want them to develop their listening skills and we also want them to feel confident in the exam. So let's do another example together. 
So we're looking at integrating teaching and learning in the activities. So there's one activity for each part of the exam. This could be part of an exam task or it could be a complete task with the audio. There is not a complete sample exam paper. There's another place for that. This is a guide to teaching, but there is a link to a mock test toolkit if you want to see a full sample exam paper. And the idea, as I said, is a step-by-step -step approach. So we're trying to build learner confidence, develop their skills and develop the strategies they have for using these skills in their listening exam. Now I said we'd look at an example. So don't worry uh, that this is a little bit small. I don't want you to read all of the words. I want you to see the overall structure. So here's an example of how the activities look in the guides. The first two pages in this example have some information about the task, the aims of this activity, so you know what you're trying to achieve by doing it, a preparation stage, and then the instructions begin and the task itself appears. And of course, there are also these blue boxes with extras like exam strategies or adaptations or extension activities. Now, because the activities go step by step, they often continue to the next page, as is the case here. So you can see that the instructions continue and there's also a link uh, because this is the first point where the listening is played. So there's a link to the recording. Remember, it takes you straight to the recording. The instructions continue. There are top tips, as I mentioned, for every activity. Of course, there's an answer key. You need the answer key. And in some cases, there's an optional follow-up which makes a link to other parts of the exams. So looking in detail, you have here a link that will take you straight to the recording, for example. And in this case, I wanted to draw your attention to the fact that the top tips are really worth reading. They're not just kind of little extras. They're often about how to take something that already works well and make it even better and make it more personal for your class. So here, for example, we have a top tip for weaker classes who need more support. But we also have a tip for fast finishers, as this is sometimes quite difficult. You know, how do we support the learners who actually found it easy and they're going really fast? What can we do for them? So the top tips are really worth checking and there's something for every activity. Okay, let's do an example together. I think you're ready for another example. So I'll be the teacher. You are my students, welcome to class. We're going to do an example from B2 First for Schools, part one. And we're going, uh, we're going to do the prepare to listen, prepare to understand section. So put your student hats on, you are learners now. We're going to talk about morning routines. And my question for you is, what are some typical things you do every morning? Can you type your ideas into the chat box? typical things that you do every morning. Exercise, coffee, brush my teeth, have breakfast, good, very healthy. Lots of people saying have breakfast. Take the dog out, yes, me too, yes. Praying, yes. Take a shower, yes. Stretch, good, <laughs> good way to start the day. Coffee, capital letters, I agree. I completely agree, I have my coffee here. Maybe you can see stretch, stretch, stretch. Lots of you saying stretching, excellent. You are a very healthy bunch. Pray, yes, exactly. Wash your face, brush your teeth. Coffee, more coffee in capital letters. Check my mobile, it's very honest of you. Check my cell phone, yes, have a nice cup of tea. Feed the cats, listening to rap music. Wow, first thing in the morning. Um, I don't feel like getting out of bed. I understand that feeling, I do. Coffee, breakfast, shower, pray. That sounds like a morning ritual. Write my blog, wow, great, great, okay. Now, imagine you're not in your home, you're in space. And what I'd like you to do now in the chat, in the chat box is tell me which of these, these routines would have to be done differently in space. I can tell you walking the dog would be a challenge. Check my oxygen level, not different activities. You don't need different activities. Think about the same activities, <laughs> but how would they be different in space? Making and drinking coffee, yes, absolutely different in space. 
Uh, I'd have a float outside instead of a walk. I like that idea. Coffee wouldn't be as nice, but we'd have one anyway. What makes you say that? Uh, eating coffee. Oh, interesting. What are the flowers upside down? <laughs> I love it. Take my breakfast in pills. Problem with liquids. Yes, absolutely. Dry breakfast. Yes, everything's getting quite dry, isn't it? Um, mm, figure out how to make coffee. Well, I'm glad that you mentioned that because my last question for you before we listen is, how do you think they make coffee on the International Space Station? And what problems do you think there are? So your ideas in the chat box, please. How do you think they make coffee? What problems do you think there are? Gravity force, a oh, special machine, ah, okay. Impossible, <laughs> whoops, oh, excuse me, I'm making the slides disappear. They don't make coffee, you think they don't make coffee? I think I would still need coffee, even if I was in space. Hot water will spill, mm. coffee beans float away from you. Yes, that's an amusing image, isn't it? <laughs> Spilling it every way. Yes, probably liquid problems. They drink it from a machine. That's interesting. Coffee powder. Ooh, okay. A lot of you are mentioning very specific coffee makers. I can see that you have uh, favorite ways of making coffee. Uh, they don't. They bring it in a bottle. Interesting. Okay. Use a straw. Huh, that's an interesting idea. Coffee candy. Ooh, I like that idea. Okay, let's find out. Shall we find out? So our next steps are to take a look at this. So here is an example task on this topic. So in the task, as it appears in the exam, you hear a teacher talking about a machine for making coffee at the International Space Station. What disadvantage of the machine does he mention? And these are your three multiple choice options. So A, the coffee it makes doesn't taste particularly good. B, it can't make the type of coffee many people prefer. Or C, astronauts have to take great care when they're using it. Now, the strategy in this activity in the guide is first to highlight the key words. So together, let's do this. Let's highlight some keywords. I'll get us started. I would say disadvantage is a keyword. We're listening for disadvantages. Maybe there are advantages but there's definitely a disadvantage that he mentions and we need to find out what it is. One of you mentions taste. Yes, okay, so doesn't taste particularly good. So not just taste, but the quality of the taste. Is it good, is it bad? Uh, somebody says can't make, yes, yes. Type of coffee. Here I'm suggesting many people prefer because I think here when they're listening, they're gonna be listening for preference. And then yes, if it can or can't make this. Great care, take great care. Lots of you are saying, yes, absolutely take great care. Okay, and then before they listen, what I'm gonna do, because again, this is about developing their skills, not testing, is I'm going to give them some phrases from the recording. And I want them to match these to the options. Which phrase do they think relates to each option? So I'm not giving them the correct answer. I'm just giving them some key language and the key language comes from the script. So here's one, putting astronauts and instruments at risk. Here's another, taste can't be faulted. Which option does that relate to? And finally, most people's favorite, which option? does that relate to? Now, before I ask the learners what they chose and before I ask you, although I can see you're putting in the chat, that's great, we're going to listen. So I'm trying to match keywords to the meanings in the options. And this is really important because of course, in the audio, they will hear different words than the words in the task. So they need to have a sense about, um, uh, a sense of synonyms of similar meanings. So we're going to listen and you're going to listen because remember you're my students here. So I hope you're ready. And we're gonna see if these phrases relate to the options you thought. Here we go. Hmm. 
Making coffee in an espresso machine requires water to be heated to a scalding 94 degrees centigrade and then passed through ground coffee under high pressure. While making coffee isn't usually a big deal, it is at the International Space Station. Under zero gravity conditions, the coffee would spurt in any direction, putting astronauts and instruments at risk. However, a new machine uses a state-of-the-art capsule system to withstand the pressure required to make coffee in zero gravity. Once ready, the coffee is transferred into a small bag, and astronauts drink it through a straw. The taste can't be faulted, but making milky foam for a cappuccino, most people's favorite, remains a step too far. Okay. Okay, so now we've heard. Now, in class, of course, I would take more time, and the guide leads you through the steps here. These are the, the order. This is the order that I would hope that you matched, and I can see from the chat box that you matched. You're all very good students. Well done. And of course, so this is a point where the class can really split, because as I can see in the chat box now with you, some people are talking about what they matched before. Some people are identifying the correct option. Some people are talking about the discussion they had before, but that's okay because this is about developing the skill and I want to develop that, that desire to discuss the task. You know, at this point, students are really invested in this. So you can see through activities like this, start by engaging with the topic. We're preparing to hear synonyms, really important for this particular task. And in the guide, in the resource pack, there's an answer key with tools to support your feedback. So when it comes to checking the answers with students later in the activity, you're very well prepared. You have the keywords, you have an explanation, you have a clear indication of which answer is correct. So looking at the steps of the activity, it should be clear what we're trying to do here. It's pedagogy with an exam focus. So we prepare to listen, we review the task, that's highlighting keywords, we listen. In, uh, in principle, we listen again, it depends on uh, what we need to do in the activity and how much time we have, of course. And then we have whole class feedback. So actually what we've done is we've practiced an exam strategy, but we've done it in slow motion as a whole group. In the real exam, these steps would still be followed. And this is the kind of exam strategy that's explained in the guides. So this isn't just left for you to imagine or guess, but it's all explained. You know, why is the activity designed this way? Why give them the script at this point? Why give them these keywords? It's all designed into the guide. Okay, and we've got just enough time to look at one other example. So this example comes from the C2 proficiency paper. So very high level part four. Let's see quickly if you can remember how many tasks there are. This one always gets me. How many tasks in part four of proficiency? We have a few options. Somebody says B, no, no, no. Two, well done. How many speakers will you hear in each task? In the C2 proficiency, five, well done, bravo. How many extracts will you hear? How many clips? Five, great, well done. How many multiple choice options are there in each task? Eight, exactly, bingo. And so this means how many extra options are there which do not match to the speakers? So here I'm sort of testing your maths rather than your exam knowledge, three. So the learners are gonna listen to five different clips but have eight options to match to them. It looks like this. This example comes from C2 proficiency, but remember there are similar tasks at the B2 and C1 levels as well. And I wanna show you an example here of how we might adapt this for different levels, different abilities. So any ideas about how you could adapt this task to give more support or less support in class? What would you do if your learners were finding this a little bit challenging or maybe finding it a little bit easy? Okay, so some ideas coming in now. Eliminate extra answers, okay. Take notes, yep, do each task separately or task one only, do it in two parts. Take notes, absolutely. Use color pencils, that's an interesting one. I confess I did not think of that one. 
absolutely. Lots of you suggesting take notes. Highlight what each task asks them to do. Absolutely, always good advice. Okay, you are reading my mind. I'm gonna speed ahead and show you. So we've got a suggestion here of a lower uh, challenge level where you give them one task only and only the five correct options. So I've excluded everything else here. I've covered it with blue. They can't see it. Just one task, just the five correct options. Or you can give them both tasks, but again, just the five correct options. Or you can flip that on its head. So you give them just one task, but you give them all the possible options. So in each of these cases, you're reducing the level of challenge, you're focusing the task, because at this point, we're developing their skills, we're developing their strategies. We're not testing them yet on how well they can do the real exam task. When we're ready to do that, then we have the highest level of challenge. So the full task, both tasks at once, all possible options. And again, this is the kind of thing that you'll see in an adaptation box in the guide. And you can see in this particular example, it guides you from the least to the most challenging. So if you have a class who are struggling, or if you have some learners and you want to differentiate the task, you can do this. It works whatever your situation, it just means you have a little bit of support so you don't have to think through how to do this. The task is already presented to you this way. And in this guide, for example, it's presented at the lowest level of challenge with just one task and only the five correct answers. So everything after that becomes more challenging. Okay, so we're coming to the end now and it's time for q and I will just show you where to find the guides so as I mentioned, the resources PDF is linked to in the guides. It's got resources for all the activities, handouts, scripts, some of which are annotated, answer keys, some of which are annotated, and a link to the mock, te uh, mock test toolkit. And on the back page of the guide, you also have links to continue developing, continue reading. The guides themselves are on the Cambridge English website. So you can go to this link, the link is in the slides, which you'll receive after the webinar. C2 guide is coming very soon, hopefully today or later this week. B2 and C1 are already there. You choose your level or your exam, choose teacher guide and the skill. And then when you search, it will appear on the page for you and you can click and download it for free. There it is. And it's got links within it to everything else that you need. Thank you, Laura. So, Thank you so I will much. leave you with a brief review on the screen. Thank you, Kate. Thanks so much for hosting. Thanks to Kate and Rasheen for hosting and supporting. And thanks to Miranda as well for working with me on these guides. And thanks to you all for attending. We have Thank a few minutes yes. for Thank questions. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your participation. The um, chat and the QA box has been going wild. Um, I know. <laughs> just, <laughs> well done for answering all those. Um, just uh, maybe just, you know, five minutes for some quick questions that we haven't had time to answer um, during. Uh, just one at the very beginning is what else can learners do to help prepare? for their exam? That's quite a, a big question, but maybe Laura, you've got some other tips or can point out something. Absolutely. I think if we think back to the challenges that we suggested at the beginning about why learners find listening tricky, mm. addressing those challenges is really good practice. So for example, having plenty of opportunity to hear different varieties of English, different accents of English, different styles of speaking, speakers yeah. of different age backgrounds and so on. And having lots of practice in class and at home are the same kinds of things that they'll hear in the exam. Yeah. So a monologue or a dialogue or an interview or a radio show. So just giving learners real world exposure to the types of things and the types of people they'll hear, that's one of the best things that you can do to practice. Yeah, that's actually answered quite a few questions there already in the Q&A oh. <laughs> box. But do you wanna have a, do you wanna go into the Q&A box and see if there's anything um, that we haven't answered slice. already from your presentation. Slice that. Okay, so. What should we do when students tell you they understand people when they talk in English? However, the listenings, they don't understand. That's a good <laughs> that's one. That's an excellent question. And I think that's where it's really important to remember exam strategy, because the nature of any exam is to test a skill within certain limits so that you can compare different people's performance in that skill. And so it's not just about understanding English, it's about understanding how the exam works. 
And I have, I've heard stories of people taking an exam with no preparation and really struggling because they weren't familiar with the task. They didn't know what they were being asked to do, even though they spoke really good English. So I think reminding students that if they're in an exam prep class, they're doing both things. They're developing the skill and they're also developing the strategy Very for the exam. Point. Yeah. Um, 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 I'm seeing lots of very kind comments. Thank you, not questions in the Q&A. Let me keep looking. Some of your suggestions are for how to drink coffee in space. <laughs> Hold on a moment, let me keep looking. Um, how far do you think extensive listening without exam conditions may help learners learn language? Uh, I definitely think that helps. That's one of the best ways to develop. Um, because the, the exam is, is a type of skill in itself and you need strategies for an exam. And it's great to learn those strategies and to get your certificate. But I know that some learners can feel nervous or you know, maybe they're just interested in other things that they don't hear on the exam. And so why not you know, continue listening outside class? That's gonna develop their motivation and it's gonna develop their ability to listen when they're not feeling under the pressure of an exam. So they're just getting exposure to the language. So really you need both. You need to approach from, from both angles. Um, just seeing uh, one on the technical anyone? aspect yes. on it. Um, could you help navigating on your website? I can't find any audio files for these tasks. Now, just to point that somebody um, mentioned earlier, in order for the links to work, for example, the link to the resource pack and um, maybe the audio, you need to actually download these PDFs onto your own computer. You can view them digitally, um, and then the links to the audio should work directly from the guides. So thank you for that question, it's a, it's a good point. So um, Laura, thank you ever so much for an amazing webinar. All the comments thank have been you. really I've kind. Really interesting talking about developing listening skills and a, and a you know a showcasing our new guide. So have a look, everybody. Thank you for all of your participation, and we look forward to seeing you again in a future webinar. Okay, bye. Thanks so much to all of you. Bye.